I want to start off today's program by saying how grateful I am to be teaching and learning and living on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people since time immemorial have been using storytelling and observation in their practice and education and research really appreciates the opportunity to learn from and with them and incorporate those practices in everything we do. So that's always how we like to start our programs. And I am so excited to introduce Sarah Wilson today, who's going to be sharing all about her work for today's program. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Um, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Danica said, um, uh, thanks so much for joining today. Um, my name is Sarah and I um, I work for the um, Marine Mammal Conservation oh. Research Team at OceanWise. Sorry, I have some weird pipe sounds going on behind me. Um, part of my role um, is coordinating our wild killer whale adoption program, um, which so that raises funds which go directly to port, towards supporting our research. Um, so June, for any of those of you who aren't aware, is Orca Awareness Month. Um, so we thought it fitting to give a talk on the killer whales in our local waters, um, or not local for anyone joining from a little further afield, but I hope you still learn something. Um, so I'll basically start off um, with an introduction on killer whales, uh, killer whale populations in BC. Um, I'll then go into the what we know and how we know about killer whale families, uh, some of the threats they face, um, and some actions that you can take to help. Okay, um, so killer whales um, all belong to one species. So BC has been known for decades as a hotspot for killer whales. Um, over a thousand killer whales roam our coastline. Um, and they, as I said, they all belong to one species called Orcanus orca. Um, so this is where the other name for killer whales come from, orca. Some people go by that name. Um, they were named killer whales um, as whalers back in the day would watch them kill other whales and literally refer to them as whale killers. Um, so identifying killer whales, um, they're perhaps the most easily recognizable cetacean um, with their black and white markings. Um, they have a tall dorsal fin. Um, they have a gray saddle patch right behind the dorsal fin. Um, they also have a white eye patch just behind their eye, and they have white abdominal markings. Um, killer whales can also be identified from a distance um, from their wide, bushy blow um, as they exhale. Um, and in addition to identifying the species, we can determine whether they're male or female once they reach sexual maturity, as killer whales are sexually dimorphic. So this means they exhibit different physical characteristics. Um, adult males have a much larger dorsal fin, um, which can grow up to six feet. Um, this fin begins to sprout when they reach puberty at about 11 or 12 years old. Um, and this fin can grow quite straight when fully grown and may show ruffles or bending with age. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the well-known late killer whale named J1 or Ruffles. So this is his fin here and you can see the ruffles, um, which is where he got his name. Um, then adult females, um, they retain their short dorsal fin throughout adulthood. Um, they're often curved. Um, and then finally, we have juveniles. And juveniles, regardless of sex, have a short curved dorsal fin. Um, the only way to, to, to identify whether a juvenile is male or female is the specific abdominal markings that I mentioned um, under their underbelly. Um, so this is why some of the killer whales, you may notice if you look on our website, um, in our adoption program, their sex is still unknown. So this basically means that uh, researchers haven't had the opportunity to get a look at these markings um, and won't know until potentially until they hit puberty or have a calf of themselves. Um, so found in every ocean in the world, um, killer whales are the most cosmopolitan cetacean. Um, so in other words, they're the most widely distributed of all cetaceans. Now, this is not to say they're the most abundant on a population number level. Um, so scientific studies have revealed there are many different populations of killer whales with distinct ecotypes or forms around the world. Um, so just in BC alone, uh, there are three different ecotypes. Um, so we have residents at the top here. Uh, we have bigs and or transients as they're known. And then we have offshore killer whales. Um, so, oops, sorry. 
I skipped ahead. Um, so each of these, um, they are all uh, genetically, behaviorally, and acoustically different. Um, so we'll start off with the residents. Um, residents feed on fish, primarily salmon species, with their preference being Chinook salmon. Um, two populations of non-associating resident killer whales exist within BC. Uh, so we have the northern residents. Um, they numbered about 300 individuals, and they are listed as threatened under the Canadian Species at Risk Act. And then we have the southern residents. Um, they number at a mere 73 individuals, and they're listed as endangered in both uh, the US and Canada. Um, next, we have Biggs or transient killer whales. Um, Biggs killer whales were named after the late Dr. Michael Big, and I'll talk a little bit more about him in a few slides. Um, so bigs are marine mammal eaters, so they'll eat anything from a seal to a harbor porpoise and have even been documented attacking larger cetaceans, um, such as grey whales. And popul our bigs population numbers at around 500 individuals and are listed as threatened in Canada. And finally, we have offshores. Um, so up until recently, we weren't sure what offshores actually feed on. Um, but it was discovered recently that it's likely they're likely to feed on sharks, so things like sleeper sharks, blue sharks, spiny dogfish, as well as deep sea fish such as halibut. Um, they're the most mysterious ecotype found in BC. Um, as their name suggests, they spend a lot of time off the coast, um, far off the coast, I should say. Um, so you can see here in this image um, how ground down their teeth get just from biting through that tough um, skin of the sharks that they feed on. Now, so um, we didn't always know um, about the three different ecotypes in BC. Uh, researchers only began to notice um, that different types of killer whales graced our waters in the 1970s. So pioneer killer whale researcher, Dr. Michael Big, uh, who I mentioned a few moments ago, um, and his colleagues began compiling photos of killer whales of Southwest BC. So from these photographs, he noticed that every individual had unique markings that they could be distinguished by. So as a result of this breakthrough discovery and all his work throughout the years, um, transient killer whales were named as Biggs killer whales in his honor. Um, so as I mentioned, each killer whale can be identified with using a high quality photograph. Um, so each individual has a uniquely different saddle patch. Um, so the light gray area behind the dorsal fin there, um, by examining the shape and scars um, on the saddle patch, we can, um, and comparing these, sorry, two characteristics to on an ID catalog, um, you can ID out the individual killer whale. Um, so if you do have a picture, a nice image of a, a killer whale's fin or a dorsal fin, um, you can access these ID catalogs um, all online. Um, so for the Southern residents, you can go to the Center for Whale Research website. Uh, the Northern Residents, um, you can go to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada website, um, and they also have the BIGS uh, catalogue there as well. Uh, the Centre for Whale Research has a BIGS catalogue as well, but they only have the more commonly cited individuals. Um, so, in the same way we identify individuals um, by photo ID, um, we can identify ecotypes, um, so by saddle patch and dorsal fin characteristics. Um, so there are a number of distinguishing features to help distinguish between residents, transients, and offshores. Um, so residents tend to have a slightly more rounded tip. So on the left there is the resident fin. Um, and they often have a black crescent shape running through their saddle patch. This is referred to as an open saddle patch. Uh, transients tend to have a more pointed or triangular shaped fin uh, with a large uniformly gray or white uh, saddle patch, and this is referred to as a closed saddle patch. Um, so offshores um, have uh, continuously rounded, are generally continuously rounded over the tip of the dorsal fin, and similar to bigs, they have a closed saddle patch as well. Um, so once scientists could identify ecotypes by photo ID, they could then begin to understand the ranges um, based on where they were photographed along the coast. Um, so, as I mentioned, residents are broken down into two populations, northern and southern. Uh, both have different ranges with little overlap. Um, so, in the, no in the summer, northern residents, the map there on the right, 
um, are commonly observe, observed around the northern end of Vancouver Island in Johnson Strait and in the sheltered inlets along BC's central and north coasts. Um, so they are sometimes seen in the areas in winter and sometimes in waters off southeast Alaska. Um, so the southern residents spend most of their summer in the Salish Sea waters around uh, southern Vancouver Island and northern Washington. Um, their winter range is a little less known, um, but they have been sighted as far north as Haida Gwaii and as far south as Monterey, California. Um, so bigs were known as transients because they rarely stay in the same place for long periods of time. Um, so they range along the western coast of North America from Alaska to the southern California coast. Um, and they tend to come back to the same areas in both summer and winter um, for harbor seal pupping in August and September. Um, and then offshores. So as their name suggests, uh, most encounters with offshore killer whales occur well away from the coast. Um, they're usually found particularly along the continental shelf, particularly near Haida Gwaii um, and 15 or more kilometers off Vancouver Island, off the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and some groups have been sighted at more inshore waters, but this isn't very common. Um, they've been encountered as far south as LA and as far north as the northern Gulf of Alaska. And overall, offshores encount uh, offshore encounters um, freak are frequent in California during the winter and Alaska during the summer. Um, so not only did Dr. Big notice difference in ID features between the three ecotypes, but he noticed differences in their social structures. So through collecting photo ID data from killer whales throughout the years, um, this has allowed researchers to compile family trees and understand the family dynamics. Um, so as this video uh, we have suggests we have one of the largest databases um, of any marine mammal in the world. Um, so what you're looking at here is a family tree um, of a northern resident killer whale family. So this is known as the A50s. Um, so resident killer whales live in a com complex matriarchal society um, in which both males and females remain with their mother indefinitely, even after they have offspring of their own. Um, so these bonds between siblings um, usually remain strong even after the mother has died. Uh, so family units um, stem from a living or recently deceased matriarch are called matrilines. Um, so resident killer whale social structure is extremely stable as there's generally no dispersal from the natal group um, by either sex. Um, this is a bigs family tree. Um, so the social structure of bigs is a little bit more fluid than that of residents. Um, although, big, big, although many bigs stay with their mothers for life, um, some leave their mother's group and join up with other bigs. Um, because they're so different from residents in this respect, um, most researchers don't refer to transient social groups as pods. Um, transient killer whale society is also matrilineal based, um, but it's considered more dynamic than that of residents um, with the regular dispersals of mat or individuals from the natal matriline. And then finally, offshores. Um, offshores are typically encountered in large groups, but very little is known about their social structure. Um, they're frequently observed to travel in large groups of 50 or more individuals. Um, that may represent temporary aggregations of smaller social units, um, but they, ha they, they have a dynamic society um, with dispersal from natal, natal matrilines, sorry, uh, similar to transients, but often come together in large aggregations as residents do. So um, as a result of long-term photo ID studies of killer whales in BC, um, we now have 40 years, over 40 years of detailed demographic data, um, especially for residents. So this has led to a good understanding of the resident population dynamics and life history. Um, so it's thought that transient and offshore killer whales is likely similar. Um, so females give birth to their first viable calf at around 12 to 15 years of age. Um, there are exceptions to this rule, for example, um, the southern resident J41, or Eclipse as her common name, um, gave birth at the age of 10 in 2015. Um, so the gestation period for killer whales is between 15 to 18 months and calves nurse for about a year. And on average, females produce an average of five viable calves over a 25 year reproductive lifespan. Um, so female killer whales life expectancy is around 80 years old. Um, males, on the other hand, um, they reach sexual maturity, maturity at about 15 years of age. Um, this is indicated by the rapid 
growth of the dorsal fin known as sprouting. Um, so males continue to grow until about 20 years of age. Um, they generally don't breed successfully until they're in their 20s and their life expectancy is a bit less than females at about 50 to 60 years of age. So considering all of these factors, the population growth um, for killer whale populations in BC and uh, indeed throughout the world is limited to 3 to 4% annually. So um, how do we keep track of all of these killer whales? Um, resident killer whales can be census annually because most of all pods or major lines can be found and their members photo identified each year. Um, so this is due to their tight social structure. Um, so any whale missing in more than a couple of good encounters with its nat natal major line can be reliably considered dead. Um, so for bigs and offshores, it's a little more difficult due to their dynamic social structure and vast ranges. Um, so with bigs, an individual is declared dead when its most common associates have been documented on several occasions over several months without the individual being present. Um, similarly, uh, very commonly documented animals are declared dead after several months or years have passed with no sightings of them. Um, so through combining these uh, efforts with sightings reports to the BC Cetacean Sightings Network, um, we're able to provide updates on the adoptable whales in our program. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how killer whales in BC are named. Um, with the northern residents, um, they're given an alphanumeric name once they reach one year old by Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, they're then given a common name generally once, once they reach two years old, which is assigned by a committee made up a number of researchers and organizations. Um, and northern residents are typically named after geographic locations in BC. So potential names for new calves would be geographic features around the area the calf's mother was named. Um, so, for example, pictured here um, is a northern resident, A72, um, who is given the name Bend after Bend Island in Cleo Channel after her mother, Cleo. Um, so her name also has a double meaning um, because it also refers to the notch that you can see in her dorsal fin there. Um, and then for the southern residents, um, they're given an alpha numeric name pretty early on. Um, they're a smaller population and seen a bit more frequently, and it's easier to tell if a, if an individual isn't present or not. Um, and they're generally given common names after they reach their first critical year. Um, and the names for southern residents are assigned by the Whale Museum in Washington. So um, threats, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on the threats um, to killer whale populations in BC, um, as this has been covered by some of the other talks that um, our team has given. Um, so if you look out, these have all been recorded and are available on YouTube. So look out for um, Dr. Lance Barrett Leonard's talk on Southern residents and Adam, Dr. Adam Warner gave a talk on killer whale genetics as well. Um, but just to kind of skim by a few of the main threats um, underwater noise or acoustic disturbance um, can disturb critical life processes survival or necessary for survival, such as foraging, resting, socializing and mating. Um, killer whales use echolocation to find their prey, um, so vessel noise can mask this echolocation, making it harder to find food. Um, killer whales also use vocalizations to socialize, share food and maintain group cohesion. Um, so these calls can also be masked by vessel noise. Um, and in small populations like the Southern residents, masking can have significant population level effects. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, um, resident killer whales rely on Chinook salmon um, for a lot of their nutritional requirements. Um, so prey availability is also another significant threat which is faced by killer whales in BC. Um, and finally, we have exposure to contaminants. Um, so recent studies have shown that killer whales in the Pacific Northwest are some of the most contaminated marine mammals in the world. So persistent, persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, um, they remain in the marine environment and build up within the fatty tissues of marine organisms at a faster rate than they are excreted. So this causes them to accumulate in the body's tissues over time. This is a phenomenon known as bioaccumulation. With killer whales being one of, or being the top predator in the ocean's food chain, um, they therefore receive high contaminant loads from their prey. 
So finally, um, how can you help Killer Whales? Um, well, as I've mentioned, we have our Killer, Wild Killer Whale Adoption Program. Um, this money goes directly towards supporting conservation research, um, primarily our genetics uh, conservation research. And you can learn more about that um, at killerwhale.org. Um, secondly, you can participate in citizen science. So make sure to report your whale sightings using the Whale Report app. Um, so these sightings go to the BC Cetacean Sightings Network um, and they give valuable information about species distribution patterns and helps in the recovery and management planning. Thirdly, give killer whale space. Um, so make sure to always follow the Be Whale Wise guidelines. These are uh, available on our Wild Whales uh, website, which is the website for the Cetacean Sightings Network. Um, or visit Whale Trail BC locations and you can observe, observe whales from land. Um, so land-based whale watching provides a zero impact alternative to vessel-based whale watching. Um, so you can eat sustainable seafood. Um, so choose ocean-wide sustainable seafood. I'm sure you've all seen the logo um, on various fish in your supermarkets. Um, you can make sure to dispose of your waste responsibly. What goes down your drain eventually ends up in the ocean. Um, and finally, clean up our shorelines. You can participate in um, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Um, you can just Google that and you will find more information there as well. Um, thanks for listening and questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so we have some great questions that have been coming through to us in the chat. Um, one question that came up when we were looking at the family trees mm -hmm. was that how can you tell if a specific killer whale has passed away or has died? How is it marked on those family trees? Um, so it, on the tree, it sort of just gets added in. So each time DFO sends out an update, they'll put the uh, date that the whale is suspected to have passed away. Wonderful, thank you. So it's definitely something to keep an eye out uh, for, for our audience if you're checking out some of those family trees. Um, the, another question that came in was if one of our guests saw a killer whale in the Sea of Cortez down in Mexico, any idea what type of killer whale that would be? Uh, <laughs> Honestly, I, I have no idea. I could suspect that it might be an offshore or a transient killer whale, but I couldn't be 100% sure. Nice. I didn't I didn't even know that they could be seen down there. So that's a great sighting. Um, a question that just came in from Debbie was how many sightings have there been for the um, one year old calf J56 or Tofino? Do you know what they've um, yeah, she gets cited quite frequently. If you actually, if you go to the Center for Whale Research um, website, they have a list of encounters and you can read through all of them and she is cited quite a bit. Very nice. It's always nice to kind of see what one particular one is up to and that's a great feature of the Killer Whale Adoption Program too. Yeah. Um, so lots of great questions thank you so much everyone and again feel free to if it's easier to put them in the chat that's great or you can put them in to the q a just at the bottom and so one question that just came in from ray was that you highlighted so many different features of their dorsal fins do you, you know why they tend to be so unique or so different um i don't quite know i would if I was to guess or speculate, I would imagine it's probably from like just genetics being passed down. Um, I'm sure they split off at some point. Um, and yeah, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure why. I know that uh, offshores generally have more nicks and scars on their um, dorsal fin and saddle patch area just because of the offshore nature. Um, yeah, so that's one reason as to why theirs is slightly different. Wonderful. And I guess a lot of those features, too, if there's like a notch or something that's just happened while the whale has been living their life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them happen from kind of like uh, ship strikes um, and interacting with fisheries and things like that. 
Um, and then we do have a question. Are there any updates on what's happening with the whale report app that people should know? Uh, that would be a question that I could direct you to my colleagues at the citation site at the BC citation sightings network. They would be the best people to ask about that. <laughs> Wonderful. So if you check out that wild whales link, that will take you to where you can find out more information about the Cetacean Sightings Network and find out more about what's happening with the app and hopefully download it if you're making it out to any of the whale trails this summer. If you're here in Vancouver or along the coast of BC, that's always a great um, trip to plan, particularly if people are staying closer to home in the next few months now that we're finally getting some nice weather. That's always good. Yeah. Um, we also had some questions coming in about the, you mentioned that the big killer whales, you know, are have quite a diverse range of food that they're hunting. Could you tell us a little bit more about kind of how they hunt or what strategies they might use in those groups together? Yeah, um, so bigs, uh, so, in contrast to residents who vocalize quite a lot when they're hunting, um, bigs are actually silent hunters, um, which kind of makes sense given that they hunt marine mammals who have more hearing abilities. Um, so they kind of are a lot stealthier sort of in their hunting techniques. Um, than the yeah, they just employ different techniques, I guess. Did that kind of answer the question? <laughs> I think so. That's great. And definitely with some of those resources that I popped into the chat, you can always learn more. There's lots of information on the fisheries and oceans website too about what they're eating, um, what kind of group sizes they're working with. But that's really interesting to know that they're silent hunters. Um, we did kind of question here from Emma, why are some killer whales entirely white? And she's given an example here of T046B1B, which is <laughs> incredibly specific. Um, yeah, so with that killer whale, I think it's they're still sort of speculating as to why, but I think it's a condition. Oh, it's called, I would need to Google it, but I don't want to Google in the middle of this. <laughs> um, but I don't think they know for sure why that killer whale is white. Um, but I think it's I think it's called Lucyism or something like that. Um, yeah, but um, I, I think they determined that it wasn't an albino whale and it has some other condition, but I don't think it impacts um, its health or anything like that. Yeah, oh, and then some of, some of them are kind of lighter when they're younger and then they get their pigment as they go on in life, but um, that whale seems to be staying white <laughs> for now anyways. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, actually, I would have completely thought that it would be um, due to, you know, albino uh, genetics, but that's great to hear that, you know, it's probably healthy in most regards, mm -hmm. just looking quite unique. Um, and I know that we have a burning question from Amy as we got this question um, in previous programs as, as well, and I'd love to hear if you have any insights. Are orcas considered keystone animals? Yes, I believe they are. Um, yeah, because uh, they are sort of top predators, um, so they have very significant impacts over the ecosystem and how the food web inter uh, connects. Yeah. Wonderful. That would have been my best guess too, but <laughs> great from you as well, Sarah. Um, oh, and we have a question coming in here about some of the false killer whales. And so not necessarily a killer whale, but do those get tracked? Do we know anything about their movements around here? Uh, I, our research in our department doesn't really focus on false killer whales at all. So yeah, I can't really answer that question, to be honest, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Maybe for any of our audience members that don't know what a false killer whale is, could you just um, explain how they really aren't killer whales at all? No, they're, um, they are part of the same family. So killer whales are part of the dolphin family, um, as are false killer whales, but yeah, they're just an entirely different species. And I think they were, I guess, given that name because they look slightly similar in their shape. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And we were very lucky for uh, a few years to have Chester, our false killer whale, 
um, living and at home at the Vancouver Aquarium after being rescued as just a small calf. So it sounds like a few people joining us today um, remember getting to see and interact with Chester. So that's always a, a wonderful memory to have. And definitely their, their skulls, their skeletons look very similar as I think that was some of the um, communication that I remember being up around the galleries at the Vancouver Aquarium at that time. Um, so we also have a question coming in from Susanna about um, are there any risks of inbreeding with these smaller groups, let's say the resident orcas, um, that, you know, if their matrilinear groups aren't dispersing as much, is that a concern? Mm -hmm. um, yes, and some of our colleagues um, on the East Coast, um, one of our researchers is actually doing her PhD, um, to learn more about southern residents and the genetics and inbreeding and things. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not well versed in genetics enough to answer that question. Um, but if anyone wanted to shoot me an email or whatever, I can definitely direct those things onto the correct, the right people. Um, yeah, I'm happy to give out my email address at the end or whatever. So yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. We can definitely include that in the chat for people if they have uh, questions that they'd like to ask about. Um, so, well, I'm just really impressed. Thank you so much to our audience for so many great questions. I'm still getting caught up here. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see so much engagement and hopefully everyone is really enjoying celebrating Orca Month this month, along with many other things to celebrate. Um, we did talk a little bit about the whale trail. Um, so Sarah, I don't know if you could kind of explain maybe what that is. And there was a question mm -hmm. about, you know, what kind of orca whales would you see on, along the whale trail? Do they get very close to shore? Yeah, um, so the whale trail uh, BC basically began in 2015 as a collaboration um, with the Whale Trail in the US, which is a Washington-based organization. Um, and it's essentially a series of sites um, along the BC coast where people are, are most likely to view marine mammals from land. Um, so each site is marked with um, either an info panel or a site marker. Um, and the info panels will kind of highlight which species you're most likely to see. And so like anywhere between here and, so, sorry, so Vancouver, um, and up into Prince Rupert, you're likely to see northern residents, southern residents, um, and transients in regards to killer whales. And then humpbacks are also like very, very common um, at the moment. Wonderful. Um, so again, really, you know, encouraging everyone to put their questions if they do have some more in the chat or in the queue and A for us. It's been such a pleasure getting to see them all come in. One question that I always really like to ask our guests is kind of, Sarah, you know, how did you get to this position in your career? Mm. Did you grow up loving orca whales or kind of what, what brought you into this? Role? Um, yeah, so I kind of, I went, I, I went and I studied science um, in university and then I kind of figured out I wanted to go down the marine biology route. Um, and I remember I went scuba diving um, in Australia and I was just blown away by just like the underwater world and everything. Um, so that I knew then that that's kind of what I wanted to pursue. Um, and then I did my master's in Edinburgh and I focused that on um, cetaceans in Ireland, which is where I'm from. Um, and then I moved to Vancouver and after waitressing and being a receptionist and volunteering in various places, um, I managed to get this job. Um, yeah. So that's the short story. <laughs> right. I love that. That's so great. I think for, you know, our audience to hear is that, you know, if you take those other jobs and other roles, you know, that doesn't mean that you aren't on the path to, to where yeah. you want to be. So that's always excellent here. Um, another question that came in about killer whales was if the two groups or pods run into each other, is there anything that happens? Do they interact? Do they have conflict? Um, they generally just kind of avoid each other. Um, 
I know there was a story a couple of years ago about, I think it was, I can't exactly remember the specifics, but I think it was Northern and Southern residents. And I don't, I think they just sort of have a little look or like, they, cause they, they all have different dialects. Um, so they sort of, they can hear one another. Um, so they know which groups to kind of stay away from and which groups are part of their own family. If you actually look up um, on YouTube, um, Killer Whale Culture, um, Lance, our uh, director, does a great video on Killer Whale um, dialects. It's really good. Nice. So that was Killer Whale Culture? Yeah, if you just type that into the search bar. It's just like a three or four minute video, but I thought it was really great when I first watched it. <laughs> I'll have to see if I can and kind of try and find it and maybe even share it on some of our other channels. Um, a question that also came in was, how far do killer whales travel into the Fraser River? If you're around there, would you ever see them? Ooh, um, I don't know. That might be a question for our sightings network to see if there's been any reports um, on how far in they would go. Because, yeah, I'm not sure of the specifics of that myself. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, there you go. Lots of resources <laughs> to connect with. Yeah. Um, and then a question that came in from El Evelyn was, uh, is there a particular time of year that most calves are born? Um, I know as we're headed into our, you know, pupping season for harbor seals, there's kind of a particular season where we see a lot of them. Um, but yeah, is there any time of year to look out for new killer whales? Um, I know last year there was several born over the summer months. So if I was to guess, I would say probably summer. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think. <laughs> well, that's great news for us as we're heading into the summer here yeah. in BC and Vancouver. So lots to keep an eye out for. And again, some great opportunities to maybe plan a trip out to some of the whale trail points. Um, one of our attendees today, Terry, who also volunteers with a lot of the programs, recommended a viewing right up on the rocky shore along White Cliff Park in West Vancouver. So if people are nearby, you can always check that out and keep some eyes on the water for us. Um, so we're just coming to the conclusion of today's program. And again, thank you so much to everyone for your great questions. And thank you to Sarah for a great presentation on what's happening with those family ties and our killer whale populations out in the wild. And I know that we're always so happy to be celebrating Orca Month and we really appreciate your time here with us today um, yeah keep your eye out um on our uh the aqua blog page as well because we'll be coming out with the blog on um on killer wells next week or the week after hopefully so yeah wonderful excellent so yeah searching the aqua blog um that's always a great way to stay connected and so that's exciting to look forward to that article coming out um so i See lots of great thank yous coming into the chat. So again, to our audience, if you'd like to type a thank you or a till next week to Sarah and I, we always love to see that coming in. And just as a few closing notes, we'll, I'll bring up a couple of slides here to show you what's coming up next in some of our presentations. Perfect. All right. Looking good. Um, so our next week's Tales from the Deep program has a sort of similar sounding title, Tales from the Tropics. And it's going to be with our tropics curator from the Vancouver Aquarium, Andrea Cotter. So again, that's Thursday, June 25th at 1 p.m. We hope to see many of you back. And we always look forward to you helping spread the word and share with others how they can tune in and join us for these live stream programs. We also are continuing for the wet lab biologist talks next week live from our wet lab at the Vancouver Aquarium with topics like Wild West Coast. We're going to be joined for another traditional talk, just like the one coming up 
tomorrow from our wet lab and we've started building in some q a days where you get to connect with our biologists and just ask them more about the work that they're doing there on site we want to continue to acknowledge that we are carrying on a reflective process as lifelong learners to work on how we can continue to build allyship towards racial justice and more and a more equitable society. And so to find out more about the work that OceanWise is doing at this time, you can also check out the full article on our Aqua blog. So that's aquablog.ca and find the full link to Dr. Johnson's article as well. And so that's on our Aqua blog is where you'll find that killer whale blog coming out in the next week or so too. And we love to hear more from you and to continue to connect, whether it's on our education.ocean.org website or finding out next coming programs at ocean.org slash learn online or to find us on Twitter at OceanWiseEDU. And we have been so pleased and kind of welcomed by the community that with their outpouring of support for OceanWise and Vancouver Aquarium for the last couple of months. We were thrilled to be able to fundraise our minimum goal for reopening our Marine Mammal Rescue Center this summer. Um, but to continue to find out ways to connect and support us, you can visit vanaqua slash savva slash community to see what's going on with those initiatives. So again, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. We'll give you a big wave and we hope to see you in our programs next time. Thank you so much.